This series contains adult language and descriptions of graphic violence throughout. Listener discretion is advised. Cavalry Audio. The actor and comedian Jay Moore grew up not far from Jefferson Township and was himself a serious wrestler from the age of 12. A serious wrestler from the age of 12. 12. And some coaches will tell you that he started a few years too late. A few years back, Mr. Moore gave an impassioned speech about the sport and an effort to keep wrestling represented in the Olympic Games. He spoke specifically about what it means to be a young man who wrestles. Here's a portion of what Mr. Moore had to say. Try and get your 14-year-old son to clean his room. You try to do that. Now take that same kid and tell him he could only eat chicken breast and spinach. Maybe some fruit once in a while. He also has to get up while it's still dark out and run five miles before school and then stay after school and grind it out in the mat room for another two hours. It's a solo sport. It's a monastic life, the life of a wrestler. Running alone, working alone, testing yourself, pushing through pain and exhaustion. And there is no payoff for wrestlers. There is no turning pro. That's why they have a chip on their shoulders. That's why wrestlers don't have friends. That's why they're spitting in cups trying to cut weight. They're doing work. I'm Brandon Morgan, and this is The Devil Within. You can run off for a long time, run for a long time, run on for a long time. Sooner or later, God will cut you down. This is episode four, Spring and Fall to a Young Child. Tommy Sullivan was a wrestler in a wrestling school, in a wrestling county, in a wrestling state. In fact, New Jersey is often listed as one of the few states where high school wrestling is a more popular sport than high school football. He was fast, he was strong, and he was disciplined on the mat. He also wasn't afraid to put the work in. It is believed that Tommy wrestled in the 105-pound weight class, a competitive division, and he excelled. Common in the wrestling community is the practice of cutting weight. If an athlete exceeds the maximum weight for his division and is at risk for disqualification at the pre-match weigh-in, desperate measures are sometimes undertaken to ensure that the athlete will be on the mat. Fasting, vomiting, abuse of diuretics, and extreme aerobic exercise are all common practices in the sport, though never openly discussed at any level of competition. This is my friend Dave Esposito. He grew up in Jefferson. His family lived down the block from the Sullivans, and he was a competitive wrestler starting in the fourth grade. He knows firsthand the commitment required, the sacrifices, and the pressure to perform when you're a wrestler in New Jersey. So I thought when someone said, I should, we should maybe go to wrestling, I literally thought it was uh, going to be like back then the WWF. I had no idea what it was. Yeah, it was definitely something that we dealt with. Uh, again, at the time, you don't realize that you just want to be the, the best that you could be. And we know, looking back, talk about sacrifice, you know, during the high school years when, when people were having fun and going through gross spurts as a wrestler, my gosh, you just. Uh, at least I was dedicated to it, and, and the team that we had was really good. And so, to your point, a lot of dedication in terms of diet and um, and training. So you're not really going to parties. You're not doing that normal social stuff. You're you're just focused on uh, on making weight, being competitive. And uh, it, you know, I don't. I wouldn't trade it for the world because I think it forms who I am now as an adult. But during looking back to your point about stupidity of of putting on a rubber suit and going out for a jog to try to make weight and that kind of nonsense of course was was not healthy at all from a physical standpoint mentally though it makes you a really tough person in new jersey and most other states there are restrictions to minimum body fat percentage seven percent and above is acceptable and the amount of weight gained or lost in the weeks preceding the match Coaches and administrators are duty-bound to adhere to these guidelines, but usually being former wrestlers themselves, the practices are covered up. 
but they're considered to be widespread in the wrestling community. When asked about growing up a few houses down from the Sullivan family, this is what Dave had to say. Yeah, um, again, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, family seemed to be a nice enough family. I'm going to call it your, your typical all-American family. Um, parents seemed normal. Kids seemed absolutely normal. He had a younger brother, if I remember correctly. And so, again, nothing would ever jump out where at you if you're driving by the house that you would think, oh, boy, you know, something weird or abnormal. Not at all. They were even members of our church, which is St. Thomas the Apostle Church. So, again, everything appeared to be the all-American family, just like probably many of us grew up with. No signs of anything weird going on. The goal of a middle school wrestler is to make the varsity high school team as a freshman. The goal of a high school wrestler is an undefeated season, followed by a college scholarship. Although it was early in his athletic career, it wasn't out of the question that Tommy could well have been a scholarship athlete. He possessed a remarkable tenacity and focus level for a boy so young. Sadly, it was those very traits that made it possible for him to become what he ultimately became. For now, let's take another snapshot of Tommy's life as a 14-year-old kid. We already have a clear picture of his obligations with regard to his devout Catholicism. Whether it was voluntary or not, it was his reality. Now let's add to that the obligations of not just a serious athlete, but a wrestler. The demands of school, the demands of being competitive, sure. That could absolutely lead into something where somebody could absolutely snap. If you play a team sport, although it requires practice and talent, you can hide to a degree if you want to. A strikeout in baseball is commonplace. A poorly defended possession in basketball wouldn't necessarily raise an eyebrow. But if you're not prepared the moment you step onto a wrestling mat, you're in trouble, and everyone watching knows it. Wrestling exposes you. It requires total commitment, or really, why bother? So Tommy's world consisted of little more than a series of obligations that would tax the mental and emotional health of most any adult. How would it be handled by a kid going through puberty? Did he have anyone to talk through things with? A coach or a guidance counselor? A teacher he could go to without the dogmatic ritual of confession? Or did he, in fact, thrive under the pressures that his life demanded? At 10 years old, Tommy Sullivan didn't stand at the end of a dynastic wrestling family. There were such families in Jefferson, fathers and grandfathers who were state champions, college champions, even an Olympian, who instilled in their sons the mental toughness and willingness to endure the physical rigors of what was, to their minds, the only pure sport that existed. Often these families had multiple sons who were dedicated to the sport by the age of six, and had strict diets, workout regimens, and daily training schedules. And the work paid off. Even a cursory glance at state tournament results over the decades would reveal the same last names over and over. Wrestling was a way of life, a point of family pride and spoken of with great reverence. But that wasn't Tommy's family. He carried no great mantle of ancestral athletic identity. He wasn't the next in line. He stood at the end of no tradition. But he must have thought that he may be standing at the beginning of one, for his devotion to the sport was total. I recently moved into a new house with my family, and as my wife and I were discussing decorating options, I realized that I didn't want a lot of my old stuff. I wanted quality pieces that would last. We all have uncompromising standards in other parts of our lives, so it doesn't really make sense to skip out on quality where we spend a third of our lives sleeping. The husband and wife team that started Bowl and Branch realized there were no sheets on the market that met their standards for quality. So they created their own super soft, expertly crafted signature sheets. I ordered their best-selling signature hemmed sheet set in white. My sheets came beautifully packaged. It was like opening up a present to myself for a better night's sleep. First of all, the sheets feel incredible. The weight of them the softness of them, the styling of the sheets. It's a classic look that evokes luxury and the height of craftsmanship. To experience an entirely new standard of comfort, 
visit bowlandbranch.com. Get 15% off your first set of sheets with promo code WITHIN. That's B-O-L-L and branch.com. Promo code WITHIN. Weight loss, man, it's a pressure cooker. Labeling foods, good or bad, all of these unnecessary dilemmas. But if you're ready to change how you see food with a psychology-based approach that considers what you eat, but also how you eat, then you're ready for Noom. Let's face it, not everyone's a gym rat. Not everyone, you know, is able to starve yourself for most of the day before, you know, it's your time to eat. So forget about someone else's idea of health. Figure out your own. Try Noom and their psychology-based approach that will help you find a healthier balance that's moldable to your life. And as a result, more sustainable. For me, if it's in the house, I'm probably going to eat it. The thing that Noom does for me is that it makes me consider my food choices in real time when I'm at the supermarket buying groceries for the week. And not only for me, for my wife and for my children as well. It's a very elegantly designed app, easy to navigate, user-friendly, super simple to log food and to see the progress you're making. Start building better habits for healthier, long-term results. Sign up for your trial at noom.com slash within. That's N-O-O-M dot com slash within to sign up for your trial today. There are crazy stories out of New Jersey about families whose sons make the varsity squad their freshman year, go undefeated, and are suddenly tapped as the next high school demigod with the world at their feet. And the parents go a little nuts. They believe the hype, especially when the phone starts ringing with Division I scouts sniffing around. Before they realize what's even happening, they've emptied out their kid's college fund on a new car, a family vacation, or an addition on the house. Such is their conviction that there's just no stopping their 15-year-old wonderkind. Talk about pressure. And you know the rest. Maybe the kid has an injury and is never the same on the mat. Or he decides that he really loves pizza and just can't make weight. Or he gets a driver's license and a girlfriend and forgets all about wrestling. But sometimes it works out. Sometimes. It's unknown what kind of pressure to perform on the wrestling mat Tommy was under. Maybe none at all. That is, maybe none from his parents. He could have been under tremendous pressure from his coach and his teammates, and we would never know about it. Or maybe the pressure to exceed athletically was all self-imposed. But it had to come from somewhere. To be that dedicated to a sport at such a young age, with all the other commitments he had to make time for in his young life, he had to have something pushing him to succeed. All we know is that he never spoke about it to anyone, not officially. Whatever crushing weight of expectation he might have been living under, he kept it to himself. Like everyone else who lived in Jefferson at that time, Dave remembers that night in January very vividly. So the night of the murder, I was actually at my girlfriend's house. She was uh, two years older than me. So she had her license, and I remember coming down White Rock Boulevard at whatever time it was, cop cars all over the place. And for a quiet, quiet town, you knew that something, what the heck happened? And so you have to pass Tommy's house in order to get to my house. Like I said, there was emergency vehicles all over the place. What the heck is going on? And then drive home. And at that time, of course, we didn't have cell phones or anything, so no one knew what was going on, but you could just see commotion outside. And then in retrospect, to think that here we are driving down the street. And at that time, he still hadn't been found um, at that point. So that's why there were so many emergency vehicles. Obviously, they found his mom. But at that point, he was still at large. So on the evening of January 8th, 1988, a cold, snowy Friday, Tommy was out late. Yes, it was a Friday night, but remember that he was 14. Being out late at that age in that household was a problem. Apparently, it was Mrs. Sullivan's turn to confront her son about the drastic change that had occurred in his behavior and in his choice of company as of late. Maybe they'd recently gotten his latest report card and it wasn't great news. Or the wrestling coach had called to let them know that Tommy had been benched. It might very well have been an inquiry from Father Fitzpatrick himself, wondering if Tommy would be at Mass on Sunday. He'd missed the last two weeks, and it really wasn't like him at all. According to Mr. Sullivan's statement, Tommy had been at odds with the entire family for a few weeks before the murder. Everything was a fight. Everything was a crisis. Or nothing mattered at all. Serious questions of concern were ignored or laughed at by Tommy. 
His bedroom door was always locked, his family shut out. His new taste in music was coupled with an equally new desire to listen to it at full volume. And speaking of his new music collection, where did he get it? His parents certainly didn't buy him any of those cassette tapes. Either he got copies from his friends, or more likely, he shoplifted them from one of the giant music stores that used to exist in the Rockaway Mall. The idea that they were stolen comes from the fact that he had all the original packaging, including the cover art and the lyrics, instead of the generic blank tape with handwritten labels. So, Betty Ann Sullivan was waiting up for Tommy to get home. She passed the hours doing the family's laundry and watching television. Then she hears the door open. She rises to meet her son as he enters the downstairs living area from the garage via the laundry room. She asks where he's been, if he's okay. Does he want to talk about anything? A mother's concern at odds with a parent's assertion of dominance. It's a balancing act you're only familiar with if you have children. Tommy's reaction is unknown, at least his initial reaction. All we know is what happened next. The next day, what we heard is that Tommy beat his mom to death with a barbell, and then he was found dead in the neighbor across the street by his shed with this with this throat slit. You're just, well, how could this be? Not in our town, it's not him. Like, how did somebody do that? He probably convinced his mother that he was going up to bed, and she went into the garage to finish the laundry. Instead of going upstairs, Tommy quietly followed his mother into the garage, picked up a dumbbell, and waited in a dark corner until she passed by with a basket full of warm clothes. Then he caved in his mother's skull with the dumbbell and stabbed her 37 times with his Boy Scout knife. Shortly thereafter, as he was calmly washing his hands in the bathroom sink, he had a short conversation with his little brother who had gotten up. Go back to bed, Brian. It's just a small cut on my hand. Mommy's taking me to the hospital. That was the last anyone saw of Tommy Sullivan. He meant to kill his brother that night. His father, too. The next thing Tommy did was set the living room couch on fire and steal his dad's car. He would be dead by morning. Remember Mr. Sullivan telling detectives that Tommy had been at odds with the entire family for the previous two weeks? We know that the beginning of Tommy's transformation began with the assignment in history class six weeks earlier and his introduction to Lance. Lance, in turn, introduced Tommy to Satanism and strange goings-on in the woods near Clinton Road. Let's revisit those six weeks and get a definitive timeline of events and try to make sense of what happened. Tommy Sullivan was living the life of your average Catholic teenager in New Jersey, which is to say he was exposed to strict, dogmatic teachings on a daily basis, including the duties of an altar boy, CCD classes, regular confession, and Bible study. He was also a serious athlete, which may sound insane to the uninitiated, until you're made aware of how seriously the sport of wrestling is taken in New Jersey. Yes, he was only 14, but by then he had years of training under his belt, and, along with Catholicism, wrestling was a way of life. He had practice every day during the season, with matches at least twice a week and tournaments during the holidays. Off-season training was year-round, with workouts and diets that were followed, well, religiously. Then there was the mounting pressure that a boy of his emotional capacity just couldn't identify, let alone deal with. He didn't realize that he was desperate for some kind of release, for permission to just take a break from his schedule, from his responsibilities, from his life. Then a seemingly benign Thanksgiving break history assignment leads to an introduction to a new friend, Lance, that would change the course of his life. Lance chooses to do a report on Satanism, and Tommy learns about a whole new world. A world of freedom, a world of rebellion, and a world of mystery that he begins to explore. It is believed that Tommy meets and is influenced by the boyfriend of Lance's older sister. This man supposedly gives Tommy his copy of the Satanic Bible and introduces him to heavy metal music. Although a skeptic, according to his own writings, Tommy agrees to join Lance on an excursion to Clinton Road, where meetings of a secret group of Satanic worshippers gather at the ruins of an ancient castle to perform rituals that may or may not involve the paranormal. 
Between Thanksgiving and Christmas, Tommy begins to exhibit behavioral changes of some concern. Nothing too serious yet, but enough to notice. He's listening to a new kind of music. He's spending time with new friends. Maybe he misses a wrestling practice. Then, just before Christmas of 1987, he returns to Clinton Road for unknown reasons, presumably to attend another ritual in the woods. And then his descent accelerates to the point that he's nearly unrecognizable, at least in personality, within a very short period of time. He shuts out his parents. He neglects his commitments to the church. He gets benched by his wrestling coach for being too aggressive and violent on the mat. He even stops spending time with Lance. The final 10 days of Tommy's life aren't very well understood. They were either so terribly normal as to not elicit any specific memories, or people don't want to discuss them because very obvious signals were ignored and people want to protect themselves. Then, on the evening of January 8th, Tommy returned from somewhere, no one knows from where, and brutally killed his mother. Then this otherwise well-adjusted kid from a good family who excelled academically and athletically, went into the woods and nearly decapitated himself. The demands of school, the demands of being competitive, somebody could absolutely snap. It may seem like we can't answer the burning question of why. We can connect the dots. A normal kid, quietly, anonymously struggling with enormous external pressures, has the misfortune of running into the exact wrong influences at the exact wrong time. It all becomes too much, and terrible, terrible things happen. That's the basic conclusion that was drawn by law enforcement, and it's the conclusion that has been accepted by all involved for the last three decades. Understand that no post hoc knitting together of tragic events will ever be perfect. There's no way to find an answer to every question. But were all the correct questions asked? For example, in a community whose identity was tied to wrestling excellence, was there adequate examination of possible ties to Tommy's status as an athlete? Is our police department savvy enough to handle something like this? Because we lived in a small town and didn't have the resources to really crack cases. There are several reports concerning wrestlers who couldn't handle the demands of the sport. Academic and athletic achievement, both of which were of supreme importance to Tommy, has, in many cases, led to sleep deprivation. Lack of proper rest, especially after rigorous physical activity, would lead to depression. Yeah, it was definitely something that we dealt with. Uh, again, at the time, you don't realize that you just want to be the, the best that you could be. In. Wrestlers struggling with depression often turn to binge eating as a release valve. Overeating then necessitates cutting weight to stay on the mat. The physical toll that unsafe weight loss takes on the body is extreme, and the mental and emotional tolls are even worse. A wrestler such as this is often left feeling lost, defeated, and hopeless. Remember the quote from Jay Moore? That's why wrestlers don't have friends. So you're not really going to parties, you're not doing that normal social stuff. You're, you're just focused on being competitive. Was any of this true in Tommy's case? Did anyone even ask? Probably. As stated in an earlier episode, Detective Hart was dedicated and thorough and there's no reason to believe that he would have neglected this avenue of inquiry. The question is, did he get honest answers? Or did he run into a syndicate bent on self-preservation? Of course not. We'd never encourage a child to cut weight like that. We'd know if he were struggling. The argument could be made that he simply had too much on his plate and that his parents should have been aware of the stresses that their son was experiencing. But then Tommy had always been an overachiever and he'd always thrived under pressure, always. And it all happened so quickly. Six weeks. More than that, six weeks over the holidays. Think about the most recent holiday season, roughly Thanksgiving through New Year's. It flew past, right? If you have young children, it may have seemed a little longer, but usually it feels like you blink, and it's the new year and time to go back to work. But that's all it took for Tommy to become a murderer. That harsh reality doesn't quite fit into the version of events the police and the prosecutors would have us all believe. And they don't tell you that Tommy's younger brother, Brian, committed suicide at the age of 21. Or that Betty Ann's sister 
became a cloistered nun in the aftermath of the crime, having spent over a decade studying child psychology and psychopathy in a fruitless attempt to gain some insight into the horror that befell her sister. The authorities even allowed her to see the crime scene photographs. What could she have discovered that drove her to choose such an extreme lifestyle? Perhaps the biggest problem with the accepted version of events is that it fails to address the two main problems that investigators discovered on the very night of the murder. Within hours of the crime, when it was believed Tommy was still alive and hiding in the woods, forensics had discovered the blood smear near the ceiling. To this day, there isn't an answer for that. Then, upon discovering Tommy's mutilated body, the second problem presented itself. Every person who caught even a glimpse of Tommy's corpse, from law enforcement, paramedics, forensics examiners, coroners, and numerous medical professionals, there was universal agreement that he could not have possibly inflicted those terrible wounds himself. And so, down through the years, long after the shock of that horrible night has faded away, the one thing that persists are the whispers. What really happened? Coming up on the next episode of The Devil Within. Ever since the forested valleys, lush meadows, and forbidding swamps of New Jersey has been a travel corridor between Boston and Philadelphia, there have been reports of a strange beast terrorizing the countryside. The descriptions vary somewhat in the beast's size and ferocity, but in most ways the reports are strikingly similar. A long horse-like face, horns, leathery wings, a forked tail, and cloven hooves. In colonial times, this creature was known as the 13th child, or the devil of Leeds Point. But today, this monster of the woods, known in folklore and urban myth, goes by a different name. The Jersey Devil. Go tell that long tongue preacher. Go and tell that true believer. Tell the weather and the church we can keep her. Tell the guy's gonna cut them down. The Devil Within is a cavalry audio production. Written and directed by Brandon Morgan. Original score by Monkey Mind Music Group. Original music by Bruce Whitkin. Executive produced by Keegan Rosenberger and Dana Brunetti. For Cavalry Audio, I'm Brandon Morgan. <laughs>